Tom received his BS in chemistry with a minor in physics from Oglethorpe University, as you know, right up the road from us. And he went a little bit further down the road over to UAB, uh, where he was in the biomedical engineering program there. And he was actually a NASA space fellow, which is quite prestigious. And you might wonder how that NASA connection ties in with his work. He worked on fibroblast signaling and phenotype switching in response to microgravity environments. As you know, over in Alabama, they had quite a history of working on microgravity environments. Uh, from there, in 2003, he went on to be a postdoc with uh, Lane Sage at the Oh, I think so. University yeah. of Washington, where he was an NIH postdoctoral fellow. And then from 2004 2006, he was a senior scientist in the laboratory at Jeffrey Hubble at the EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland, where he also worked on extracellular matrix proteins. In 2006, he joined us here at Georgia Tech in the ME department. Um, Great. Thanks so much. Uh, and uh, let me thank. Um, uh, IBB for inviting me. I always love this uh, seminar series, uh, getting to hear uh, all of our colleagues speak, and so uh, it's definitely um, a nice experience for me to be able to get up here and talk a little bit about uh, what my lab has been up to over the last uh, four years. Uh, so the title of my talk is uh, Designing Cell Instructive Matrices, and essentially we take bioengineering approaches to the discovery slash, I will say, understanding of I'd like to say that we actually discover new things, but um, uh, there's very little out there in the field to be uh, actually discovered. Uh, we're really into trying to understand uh, the phenomenon of the extracellular matrix, uh, and then to deliver, uh, deliver either repair regenerative ECMQs that, that we've pulled out. So uh, the cell and its extracellular matrix uh, form uh, a very homeostatic system. So uh, in the case of cell ECM, uh, cells will actually transcribe, translate, secrete, and assemble uh, a fibril uh, matrix uh, comprised predominantly of proteins and proteoglycans. Uh, the caveat with cell matrix interactions is that once a cell has created its extracellular microenvironment, that microenvironment then uh, exerts a specific instructive power over the cells. And so there's really, uh, when we talk about cell matrix interactions, we're really talking about a battle for control uh, of what that tissue state is like. And I think Edna Cookerman here, uh, who's at uh, the Fox Chase Cancer Center, actually she was, and now at uh, the University of Connecticut, I think demonstrated this uh, extremely nicely uh, in this study here where uh, she actually took, uh, she uh, formed an ectopic tumor uh, subcutaneously, uh, allowed it to develop in the mouse. Uh, she then took that tumor and took some normal tissue of the mouse in an adjacent area, uh, decellularized those matrices, put them down on a culture dish, uh, and then asked uh, what, what cell phenotypes uh, do we do uh, arise uh, when we plate normal fibroblasts on both a sort of tumor associated matrix versus a normal matrix. And what she found was that when you put uh, normal cells on a tumorigenic matrix, they actually begin to transform. Uh, so they take on a decimal plastic nature, uh, seen here, uh, and actually start that transition towards a cancer cell. So uh, this is not necessarily new. Uh, I think what was uh, really exciting about this work was that when she took normal fibroblasts, allowed them to make an extracellular matrix, and then pulled the tumor cells out and plated them on a normal matrix, they actually lost their decimal plastic differentiation. So they turned more normal. So we say, aha, that's it. All we have to do is fix the matrix and we can fix these kinds of pathologies. Uh, unfortunately, what she found was as soon as the cells could actually turn over the matrix, so the cells are continually both degrading and reforming the extracellular matrix, as soon as those uh, tumor cells were able to reform the matrix, they went back to their decimal plastic phenotype. So there's, uh, it sets up this paradigm where the cells are probably ultimately in, in control of the situation, but certainly the extracellular matrix is driving certain cues to tell the cells what to become. Uh, another study, and this happens to be her mentor, so this is not my Kenyamata love story, but it, uh, he does have a lot of good work coming out of his lab. 
Uh, in this case, uh, what Ken is looking at uh, is the role of extracellular matrix, in particular fibronectin, in regulating uh, the branching program. So I'm in the regenerative medicine field and one thing we're always trying to do is figure out how do we get complex three-dimensional tissues to form, to pattern the way we want them to. Here, this is a mammary gland. Uh, we actually work in the lung in our lab. But what are the cues that define these clefts that are forming versus these buds that are forming? And if we can regulate that, uh, then perhaps we can um, realize the, the potential regenerative power of stem cells of the extracellular matrix. So, uh, unfortunately, in the, uh, it's difficult to translate what we see at the developmental level to the adult. And a main uh, reason for that is that each ECM maturation in the adult is slightly different from the embryo. Uh, so, you know, we might want to elicit a regenerative event after uh, let's say we cut off a finger. Uh, well, one of the seminal events when you cut off your finger, I wouldn't suggest that, uh, is uh, the formation of an early provisional matrix, which is comprised predominantly of the blood clotting protein uh, fibrin, or fibrinogen. So fibrinogen is activated, it forms a polymer uh, in response to vascular injury, and uh, as a part of that process, we cross-link in the extracellular matrix protein that Ken Yamato is interested in, fibronectin, okay? This extracellular matrix, this provisional matrix, actually only exists for uh, a few days, maybe as long as a week. Uh, it's actually uh, rapidly degraded by cells that are invading that uh, wound area. Uh, and they actually then synthesize what we call a late provisional matrix, which is comprised predominantly of aligned fibronectin fibers with interspersed cross-linked collagen. It's this matrix that our lab is predominantly interested in from a standpoint of cell instruction. The reason is that a couple of really interesting findings, I would say in the late 90s and early 2000s, show that you can't transition from an early provisional matrix to what we consider a mature matrix, that would be collagen, elastins, laminins, uh, without this fibronectin matrix. Uh, so if we knock out fibronectin in cells, they never form a collagen matrix despite their ability to transcribe it, to translate it, and to secrete it, they simply can't assemble it into a mature form. Uh, part of that uh, was explained due to the fact that fibronectin actually acts as both the template for uh, immature collagen fibers to align, uh, and then fibronectin then stabilizes those collagen fibers until they can be cross-linked. Uh, so without fibronectin, uh, we don't develop a mature collagen network. Uh, for, from our perspective, uh, fibronectin is really attractive from a cell instructive uh, 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 standpoint due to the, the reality that it's packed with lots of nice biochemistry. Uh, so this is the molecule. It's a dimer. It's a relatively large dimer. Uh, it's about 440 kilodaltons, the entire protein. Uh, and what we see on the protein are uh, sites for factor 13 cross-linking sites. This is where it is cross-linked into the, that provisional matrix, that fibrin matrix. Uh, it binds fibrin. It binds heparin. It will also bind collagen and gelatin. So this now you can begin to see where it's bridging fibrin networks to collagen networks. Uh, additionally, uh, regions that we're interested in are these type 3 repeats here in blue. Uh, and they bind a significant number of, of cell surface receptors called integrins. So integrins are the cellular receptors that bind extracellular matrix, uh, and uh, fibronectin is one of the more um, one of the molecules in the extracellular matrix that binds the most diverse number of integrins. So if we look at uh, here's a nice little pictorial representation, uh, and we look at these integrin binding domains. So this is where the cell instruction comes in. This is matrix assembly, cell instruction, and what we see is if we take a slice. Uh, really the seventh through the tenth type 3 repeat, uh, and this is an inexhaustive list of the number of uh, cell surface receptors, uh, integrins, that uh, this molecule is binding. Uh, here is listed eight, uh, but there, it's been predicted that as many as 12 different integrin heterodimers may bind uh, fibronectin. What's important about this is that depending on which integrins 
the cell interacts with its extracellular matrix, uh, it will, uh, number one, elicit very specific signaling cascades within the cell. But number two, it actually modifies uh, the cell's response to soluble factors like growth factors and cytokines. So it's fundamentally important that not only we understand which integrins that the cells are interacting with with their matrix, but in the case of uh, trying to engineer cell instructive matrices, this domain provides a lot of interest for us uh, to be able to, to tweak these responses. Uh, so a couple of concepts I want to get across and I'm going to give some props. I don't think is Evan Zamir here. I'm going to give some props to Evan here in just a minute. Uh, so a couple of concepts that I, I need you guys to be aware of. Uh, when we look at uh, the process of fibronectin uh, fibril assembly, so that is uh, going from a monomeric form into a fibrillar matrix, uh, it actually requires force. Uh, so we actually bind. Here's an integrin. It's bound to fibronectin. Uh, this elicits uh, particular uh, intracellular signaling cascades. Uh, in general, uh, SARC and FAC activation which leads to the formation of an actin stress fibers and cell contractility. So the cell begins to form these contacts and then begins to pull, pull on this molecule. So uh, it pulls on this molecule, it separates the integrins, and as a result, we actually expose buried cryptic sites within that fibronectin molecule. So you can think about fibronectin as a wound up rubber band that's all tightly um, twisted on itself and literally the cell is pulling that rubber band out so that now we expose little domains that were previously hidden. Those domains then enable fibronectin to self-bind and in this way we pull, assemble, pull, assemble, pull, assemble. Um, this is really critical in understanding um, two things. One is that we can't generate a fibronectin matrix without cells. Uh, it's an inherent difficulty in what we do, uh, and we're working on some different methods that I'll discuss a little bit later uh, to try to facilitate that process. But secondly, what I want to get across is that the molecule is highly elastic. Uh, the type 3 repeats uh, that I'd mentioned where uh, integrins actually bind are the most flexible. Uh, they're held together completely by hydrogen bonding, and as a consequence, when the cell pulls on those domains, they're actually capable of undergoing bond slippage and then breakage uh, until they open up. If we then let go, if the cell then lets go of that fibronectin molecule, they then reform in a reversible manner with very little hysteresis, so very little energy loss uh, due to that refolding event. So here's my props to Evan. Uh, this is, um, again, sort of on the trying to inspire you guys that that now a fibronectin rich extracellular matrix, which is this that uh, Evan has stained and now tracked it during embryogenesis, uh, the, the fibronectin matrix is not a static entity. It's actually always moving. And the cells that are within that matrix, okay, I'm not good at doing that. Uh, and the cells that are in that matrix are pulling and moving, and as a consequence, the fibronectin fibers uh, and if you uh, take a look at this, uh, he draws a grid of squares or uh, of circles here and you can see that some of the circles are moving apart which would imply uh, a level of fiber strain uh, and some are moving together which would imply uh, compression of those fibers. So during embryogenesis and during most repair processes uh, in the adult, as cells move in and pull on their extracellular matrix, they're physically pulling, uh, straining that matrix. So conceptually that's important because um, uh, what we're interested in is whether those mechanical events are then translated into the biochemistry of the fibronectin molecule, uh, unfolding those type 3 repeats and resulting in alterations in, that in the integrin profiles that are binding, uh, binding that molecule. So we're not quite as uh, fancy as Evan. We don't have any really cool developmental models just yet, although we're working on them. Uh, what we have done is we've taken a look at uh, some adult processes. Uh, in this case, we're looking at, here's a normal lung alveolar structure. Uh, and this, this tissue actually is re being repaired and regenerated every single day of your life. So every time you breathe in, you're breathing in particulate matter. That particulate matter is being endocytosed by cells, usually in this region and here. Those cells are undergoing apoptosis. It's causing tissue damage. 
they then regenerate every single time you breathe. So what we want to understand is why in most human beings uh, we maintain this nice uh, three-dimensional architecture of lung and in some individuals uh, we develop fibrosis. Uh, that being denoted here. More fundamentally, we're interested in what are the ECM cues, uh, and in this case, um, uh, biomechanical cues in the extracellular matrix that are defining this tissue uh, versus this tissue. And this work actually harkens all the way back to my days at UAB, uh, where we actually pulled out these fibroblastic foci. Uh, these are hives of highly proliferative fibroblasts that are indicative of pulmonary fibrosis. If we pull fibroblasts out of this guy, and we pull fibroblasts out of a normal lung, uh, they display two different phenotypes. Uh, and those phenotypes are uh, related to their expression of a small uh, outer leaflet glycoprotein called Thi1. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this, but uh, what we found, uh, gosh, almost 10 years ago, uh, is that Thi1 becomes a regulator of Rho activation. Uh, and Rho activation leads to cell contractility, focal adhesion formation, and stress fibers. So we have these fibroblasts here that are Thi1 negative that lack this uh, machinery, and we have normal fibroblasts that have this machinery, and what this sets up are two populations of cells, one that's highly contractile uh, and pulling on its matrix, and the other that's more homeostatic in nature. So that sort of sets up our main question in the lab, which is uh, how, how might adjacent and physically different extracellular matrices determine cell and tissue state? Uh, we drew this little uh, simple diagram to try to help frame what we do in the lab. Uh, and uh, fundamentally what we're looking at is uh, here fibrosis associated pulmonary fibroblasts generate fibronectin matrices that we know um, display increased um, are experiencing increased strain. Okay, so the cells are more contractile, they're pulling on their matrix more, and as a consequence, they're going to do two things. One is uh, they're going to generate a stiff ECM, which has bio potential biophysical effects on the neighboring cells. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at a scenario where uh, the cell's stiffness, where the interior of the cell uh, is trying to match its substrate compliance with its extracellular environment. Uh, and to do that, it has to modulate rack and row signaling, uh, the same signaling network that was altered in our pulmonary fibroblasts. So as the pulmonary fibroblasts stiffen their extracellular matrix, these biophysical cues are translated into the neighboring cells, altering their steady state of um, contractility. And as a consequence, then, this may result in some phenotypic determination. Consequently, if I have a highly contractile fibroblast and it's pulling on its matrix, uh, it actually has the opportunity to unfold those type 3 repeats of fibronectin that we're so interested in. If they unfold those type 3 repeats, then there's a potential that the integrins that are able uh, to bind that matrix then shift from one population to another. So there could be biochemical um, effects of uh, this ma uh, matrix stiffening. Uh, here, again, stiffness of ECM mediates the capacity of fibronectin to unfold, and fibronectin unfolding controls, uh, we've been focused on beta-1 integrin binding and row rock um, activation. Okay, so this is some really nice work done by uh, one of my newer grad students, Vince. Um, so we're interested in trying to figure out what's different about this matrix in a normal lung and this matrix uh, in a fibrotic lung. And unfortunately, these images are not coming out really well, uh, but we can actually stain these tissues for type 1 and type 2 cells, and we get normal architecture. And what Vince does is actually we instill, so we induce pulmonary fibrosis in one mouse and uh, inject saline in the other. Uh, after about 21 days, we harvest the mice, and we actually inject a soft, uh, low-melting temperature agarose into the lungs to inflate them. Vince then pulls them out, we embed them in another block of agarose and then uh, with the vibratome actually make about 100 micron thick slices of living lung tissue. So these cells in this tissue are alive and they stay alive for about 48 hours. Uh, what that allows us to do is then uh, with the help of Todd Solchek up in mechanical engineering 
uh, we've gone up and actually done mechanical measurements at the cellular level using atomic force microscopy. Uh, so we had a hunch that uh, this matrix would be stiffer than uh, a normal matrix, so uh, fibrotic would be stiffer than, than normal. And what Vince has found is that there's actually a pretty tight distribution of, um, when we measure Young's modulus of these lungs, normal lungs being in the realm of about 2 kilopascals, uh, and fibrotic lungs ranging from about, I guess, maybe 25 to 15 kilopascals. Uh, here, uh, the box plots sort of show the spread. We do see stiffness values up near 80 kilopascals in the lung. Uh, so uh, the, the big question then is, okay, so if we do see alterations in the physical stiffness of the extracellular matrix or these tissues, does that confer some sort of altered cell phenotype? So I'm going to back up for a second if I can. And the main phenotype that we're interested in studying here then becomes this regenerative event whereby when the lung is injured, so the alveolar space is injured, uh, the alveolar precursor cell, uh, known as the AT2 cell, has to differentiate into this um, uh, gas permeable cell here, uh, the AT1 cell. Uh, what we're concerned about and what there's some uh, growing evidence is that in fibrotic lungs, these AT2 cells, instead of differentiating down the normal pathway, terminally differentiating into epithelial cells, they actually undergo a transdifferentiation to a mesenchymal phenotype, invade the matrix, and then synthesize more extracellular matrix, uh, resulting in sort of this uh, positive feedback loop uh, where, whereby you generate these fibroblastic foci. So this event of normal differentiation versus transdifferentiation uh, what we call epithelial to mesenchymal transition is a really critical uh, cell behavior, uh, certainly for fibrosis, but certainly for the formation of three-dimensional tissues, for cancer metastasis, et cetera, et cetera. So we wanted to ask whether these different environments are listing different responses. Uh, we modeled that with a really simple system. We formed polyacrylamide gels, very thin polyacrylamide gels. Uh, surface immobilized extracellular matrix proteins, uh, seed our cells on top of those matrices and ask what are the phenotypic changes that, that occur. Uh, here what we're looking at is uh, simply proliferation and what you can see, uh, this is some work by uh, Ashley Carson, excuse me, Ashley Brown, uh, that um, shows that uh, in this case uh, type 2 alveolar epithelial cells undergo a uh, stiff, stiffness dependent uh, proliferative response up to about, well, what do you know, 20 kilopascals, right around the range that we see in the normal lung, in the fibrotic lung. Uh, this response then actually tails off on stiffer materials uh, here at 36 kilopascals and uh, comes actually significantly down on tissue culture plastic. Uh, what she'd done then was uh, obviously we're interested in this dynamic whereby the stiff extracellular matrix modifies the interior stress of the cell and I mentioned that that's uh, mediated primarily through activation of Rho signaling and cell contractility. So what Ashley did here, I'm sorry for the missing the labels, uh, she actually added uh, a Rho inhibitor, actually technically a ROC inhibitor uh, that inhibits Rho signaling and she shows that you can abrogate those uh, stiffness dependent responses. Again I'm sorry for the uh, projection of the images, uh, what we then wanted to do is ask uh, whether or not uh, normal epithelial cells, these AT2 cells, actually take on an altered morphology. Uh, so normally you'd like to see AT2 cells in a nice cuboidal, cuboidal form, lots of cell-cell contact, and not in a highly spread state. Uh, again, what Ashley's shown here with actin staining and alpha smooth muscle actin is that, uh, you'll have to trust me on this, here's the numbers if you, if you don't, <laughs> uh, is that in increasingly stiff uh, substrates, the cells actually go from a more epithelial phenotype, so more cuboidal, into a much more spread fibroblastic or mesenchymal uh, type of phenotype. Uh, we can maintain, even on, this is on both fibronectin and laminin controls, or both on glass or plastic, you can actually maintain epithelial phenotypes with laminin, and so that's our control here. Uh, and what she showed here was in the first panel are uh, just the cells. In the second panel is the uh, Rho inhibitor, or Rho signaling inhibitor, 
uh, in the same paradigm here in alpha smooth muscle actin. And what you see is, again, with increasing stiffness, we see uh, a loss of cell circularity. So the cells are going from round to spread. Uh, here's the laminin control. And if we add the Rho inhibitor, then we abrogate some of these responses. Okay, so cells are proliferating more on stiffer materials as we go from normal to more fibrotic um, uh, physicalities. Uh, the big question then becomes, and, and they're spreading more, but this doesn't necessarily indicate that they're becoming mesenchymal cells. Uh, so what we want to do then is actually look at specifically at epithelial, the expression of epithelial markers and the expression of mesenchymal markers. Here we've done uh, qPCR. Uh, on both ecadherin, which is a cell-cell junction protein. Surfactant protein C is actually a protein that's specific for uh, alveolar type 2 cells. Uh, and what we see is that on increasingly rigid substrates, we actually begin to lose the expression of e our epithelial marker. We lose significantly, and so you'll have to look at the breaks in these graphs. Um, this is a hundredfold decrease uh, from 8.5 kilopascals to 13 uh, kilopascals, um, uh, loss of expression of surfactant protein C. Uh, here we're actually gaining the expression of uh, mesenchymal markers in cadherin uh, and vimentin. And again in the red what you can see is that when we add that ROC inhibitor we abrogate some of these responses. So what it's looking like is that as the, as uh, potentially as fibroblasts begin to modify this interstitial space, um, making it more stiff by condensing uh, the, de uh, the um, matter in that area, uh, we get a stiffer environment and that that's actually affecting the peripheral epithelial cells that are lining those fibroblastic foci. Um, so I'm going to switch gears and now uh, talk a little bit about our work on then if cells are, if fibroblasts are um, um, contracting their extracellular matrix, there's the potential for biochemical alterations in the extracellular matrix. And in particular, our focus is again on this unfolding of uh, fibronectin type 3 repeats and the loss of certain integrins' uh, capacity to bind that matrix. So, so first we have to ask the question, okay, well, uh, if a cell is altered in its row activation, do we actually see that we get differences in fibronectin unfolding? And so what we've done is, um, this is actually work done with assistance of uh, Viola Vogel, who's now at the ATI in, um, in Zurich. Uh, we actually go through, here's a, a schematic of fibronectin. We actually then label uh, the fibronectin in very specific spots, both with an acceptor and a donor fluorophore. And then as the cells begin to pull and unfold the molecular structure of fibronectin, we get the donor and acceptor fluorophores moving apart and we actually observe a decrease in our resonance energy transfer. Uh, so we get a loss of FRET signal as this molecule goes from a compact conformation into a partially unfolded conformation. Uh, so we generate heat maps uh, like this. This is just a fi uh, standard fibroblast culture. Uh, and here what you can see is the, um, the quantitation of uh, our loss of fret with actual unfolding or let's say strain of fibronectin fibers. Uh, so what we've done here is, uh, this is some work that uh, I had done actually in my postdoc that set up some of, the, some of the things we're doing in the lab. Where you have a normal fibroblast, this is a pulmonary fibroblast uh, that's uh, wild type. And in this case we've knocked out a protein that's essential for its ability to uh, um, to contract its matrix, uh, so it actually interrupts that cell cytoskeleton uh, machinery. And what we see is we get gross differences in fibronectin assembly, but perhaps what's more important if you look at the blue versus the red line is that normal fibroblasts unfold fibronectin observed as a loss of FRET signal uh, to a significantly greater extent than cells where we have interrupted their uh, contractile signaling. Okay, so that's a, that's a transgenic where we've knocked something out. It's, it's hardly physiologically relevant uh, in that sense. So what about this scenario if we go back to uh, this idea that normal fibroblasts are expressing Thi1, abnormal fibroblasts are, have lost the expression of Thi1, 
If we look at them pictorially, uh, here's some images from Rick Phipps uh, lab who actually initially described these uh, fibroblast subpopulations. And what we see is that the profibrotic cells, uh, the thi one negative cells, actually um, strain uh, fibronectin fibers to a greater extent than thi one positive cells. So that's normal, normal fibroblasts here and fibrotic fibroblasts here. So we're still following that work up, and uh, Vince is following up on that trail, uh, looking at the dynamics between thi one expression and surface uh, substrate rigidity on uh, fibronectin unfolding. Uh, what Ashley had tried to do, this was in our very first year, she's probably having bad flashbacks right now uh, of this work, um, but uh, so we actually asked the question, well, if we pull fibroblasts out of uh, these mice and we try to physically manipulate the matrix without the cells, right? So I mentioned an important feature is that unfortunately we can't generate a fibronectin matrix without cells. So we have to pull cells out of the lung. Uh, we plate them here. This is on, plated on PDMS sheets uh, so that we can actually strain that system. We then uh, go through a decellularization process and a characterization process. And here you see those matrices in this last panel are almost exclusively fibronectin. We have a very little bit of laminin, uh, no collagen one or three, and no collagen four. Uh, we can actually then label that with beads uh, to try to uh, map the strain elements uh, uh, as we begin to apply forces to that matrix. So if we do that, we have this nice little strain device that allows us to wrench on that fibronectin matrix that's been assembled on this little thin um, PDMS sheet. Uh, we can actually get these rearrangements in the fibronectin matrix. And when we seed alve uh, alveolar type 2 epithelial cells on these, we see when we strain that matrix 50, 75, or 100 percent, we get, begin to see the expression, and this is at the protein level, of mesenchymal markers like vimentin. Okay? Um, we actually also see, uh, very similar to what we'd seen uh, before, sort of a biphasic response of proliferation uh, to strain in the matrix. Now the unfortunate part of this is that you can imagine if you have a matrix that looks uh, very heterogeneous uh, like this. You have fibers in many different orientations. The fibers are different thicknesses um, and uh, probably molecularly they're packed slightly differently. Uh, you can imagine I apply a strain and I cannot determine the difference in my cellular responses due to fiber alignment. So as I pull on the fibers they'll go from a random orientation to an aligned orientation versus fiber unfolding. So that's domain unfolding. So unfortunately, we can't really make definitive claims regarding mechanism uh, with this data. So we actually decided to, uh, and so I, I guess I should point this out, uh, we asked ourselves a question, are observed cell phenotypic changes due to the exposure of cryptic sites or the disruption of integrin binding motifs, and we simply lack uh, the necessary reagents to, to figure that out. So we actually switched gears and went more biotech on this particular project. Uh, again, looking at fibronectin here and zooming in, zooming in on the cell binding domain, which is comprised of these type 3 repeats. Uh, what we decided to do was instead, uh, if we want to test the hypothesis that fibronectin uh, domain unfolding results in integrin switching and alterations in cell phenotype, uh, let's just make this recombinantly. So that's what Ashley did. Uh, this is based on some fundamental work, again, by uh, Viola Vogel, some great work by Cheng Zhu here at, uh, at Georgia Tech, uh, and Klaus Schulten uh, up in uh, Illinois. Uh, what we do know about these two domains, this is the uh, cell binding domain here, is that if we apply a force uh, on this type 10 repeat, this 10th type 3 repeat, we actually elicit these sort of unraveling events. We can actually then begin to modify this by regulating the amino acid structures in these two domains to perturb, uh, physically perturb those hydrogen bondings uh, events that are holding these two domains together. So basically what we can do is we can make the domains stiffer so that it's, it's harder for cells to actually unfold those domains or we can make them floppy so then they begin to wobble around. 
Okay, so this is the hypothesis that if we have wobbly, floppy uh, fiber nectin domains, then we may get an integrin that would normally bind now in an off state because it simply cannot recognize that motif. Whereas when it's when fiber nectin is in its normal conformation, in this tight conformation, that integrin can bind. Uh, so again, Ashley looked at uh, we stabilized the ninth and tenth type three repeats. Uh, and we show that it significantly induces, uh, influences cell morphology. So this is pretty, um, pretty striking. We're actually able to keep the epithelial phenotype on fibronectin. Uh, this was for 48 hours, but we've shown actually in this case, uh, she went all the way out to, to uh, 12 days. Around five days, we can keep that epithelial morphology. Uh, and I think we're keeping some of it as far out as 10 days, uh, excuse me, 12 days. Uh, the remarkable thing about this is that every piece of literature uh, so far states that if you place an epithelial cell on fibronectin, it will undergo EMT within three days. And so what we're seeing here is that perhaps that's not the full story. Uh, perhaps there's an issue where uh, in experiments people are plating fibronectin, surface coating fibronectin, and they're actually getting molecular unfolding of those domains, which is eliciting these types of responses. What we did find was that if we lop off the ninth type 3 repeat, so we have one domain that's stabilized, we have one where we just simply cut off the ninth type 3 repeat. The importance about that is that those two domains actually work in synergy together to bind a specific subset of integrins, whereas only the 10th type 3 repeat binds a different subset of integrins. So if we actually now push the cells to interact with one integrin set versus another, uh, then what we can do is we can maintain these epithelial phenotypes or we can actually drive, uh, these are predominantly mesenchymal cells at this stage. Now it should be noted that uh, we, can, we can overcome any of these matrix effects by adding some master regulator like TGF-beta. TGF-beta for the fibrosis world is the bane of our existence. Uh, it will turn any epithelial cell into a mesenchymal cell. Uh, and here we're showing that we're not, we're not seeing anything out of this world. Uh, TGF-beta drives all of these cells uh, to a mesenchymal phenotype regardless of their substrate. See how I'm doing on time? Okay. Uh, so what we wanted to understand was a little bit about the mechanism. So, okay, so what? So we modify these fibronectin domains and we get one cell phenotype over the other, but the big question is why? Uh, can we really explain this? Uh, so what we wanted to do was look at what the integrin profile is uh, that, uh, that cells are engaging these fibronectin fragments with. And what we found was when we do an attachment assay here to our stabilized mutant, we see that it's predominantly a result of alpha-3 uh, integrin binding, alpha-V, beta-6, beta-1, and alpha-5. Beta-3 and alpha-V, uh, which were predicted, did not uh, elicit a huge binding response uh, uh, to this fragment. The converse is when we lop off uh, the synergy domain, uh, this ninth type 3 repeat, uh, alpha 3 completely lacks any functionality uh, with cells binding to that domain. We still see alpha V beta 6, a little bit of alpha, uh, excuse me, of beta 1, but non significantly. And the mouse is sitting right in the way. Um, here, uh, a little bit more beta-3, but now alpha-V begins to dominate. So you can see now this shift from interaction with alpha-3 and alpha-5 integrins to interaction with alpha-V integrins. And so we're beginning to think that, that that's uh, one of the regulators of what's going on here. Uh, what this is simply showing is that the responses are predictably uh, sensitive to the addition of soluble um, integrin ligand, uh, this in the form of RGD. This is our synergy domain, so this is the domain on the ninth type 3 repeat that uh, synergizes RGD binding. And then together we completely knock out uh, any cell binding to those fragments. Uh, as we predicted on the case of um, fibronectin type, uh, the tenth type 3 repeat, it's predominantly uh, mediated by RGD uh, and almost none by, by synergy. So we've, we're moving more quantitative uh, with this work now. Uh, this is still work in progress um, uh, with Ashley. 
And uh, what we've uh, begun to do is actually measure uh, quantitatively integrin binding to our fibronectin fragments using surface plasmon resonance. And so this is um, um, a methodology whereby this whole process is to immobilize, we immobilize integrin on uh, a gold substrate uh, and uh, through light diffraction we can actually measure mass additions to the surface uh, due to uh, this, this plasmon resonance uh, effect. Um, and so what happens is then we immobilize our integrins and we flow our fibronectin fragments across these surfaces and we ask do we see binding events or not and what is the magnitude of those binding events. So if we do our homework and we do our nice little dose response curve here um, and we do it under the proper conditions, uh, low flow, etc. Uh, then we can actually model this data and back out binding uh, kinetics. Uh, this here is actually uh, the dissociation constant uh, for our different uh, fibronectin fragments, in this case to alpha 3, beta 1. And so what we're showing is that uh, the binding to our stabilized mutant is about 23 nanometers, uh, nanomoles and we're approaching that of the traditional alpha 3, beta 1 integrin uh, binding domain which is uh, laminin. So that's still work in progress. Uh, if we now take those alveolar type 2 cells and then plate them on these different fragments, uh, we see very similar things to what we've seen before. We actually, when we lose synergy, we lose, um, when we lose the synergistic binding between the 9th and 10th type 3 repeat, we actually begin to lose expression of our uh, epithelial markers and we begin to gain expression of mesenchymal markers. So the unfolding events, at least at this point in time, what we can say is that the presence or absence of synergy is driving or main, I should say maintaining an epithelial phenotype. We're not yet to the point where we can say molecular unfolding is resulting in EMT. But we're working on that. Okay, so this is just trying to figure out what, what may be some of the mechanism involved. So we know which integrins are binding these fragments, but it doesn't really, it still doesn't tell us how these things are becoming uh, mesenchymal cells. This is some work looking at PI1 expression. PI1 is a um, immediate downstream uh, target of the TGF beta signaling pathway. So an activation or an expression, enhanced expression of PI1 is indicative of enhanced TGF beta activation and signaling. So what we see is in this case, uh, here's the normal response, and this is pretty normal, on fibronectin, uh, in the presence of fibronectin and TGF beta, we obviously see a nice whopping uh, expression. On laminin, TGF beta does not elicit uh, a PI1 response, so this is our negative control. And over here, what you see is that on our stabilized mutant, we actually, if we um, look at fold expression with respect to that, we see that we get a doubling of the expression of pi 1 uh, when we remove that synergy domain. So uh, this is still far from conclusive, but what we're thinking is happening is that as the integrins shift from alpha 3 beta 1 to alpha V integrins, uh, they're actually taking on a more contractile phenotype, which is enabling, uh, uh, enabling their activation of TGF beta which is an inherently mechanical, mechanical event. Okay, so uh, where we're really trying to go with this work, and I'm not going to talk about this except to kind of give you some, some teasers. Hopefully, maybe a year from now, we'll be able to give uh, a talk on this. So uh, one of the things we're really trying to do is figure out how can we generate fibronectin fibers so that we can do these studies on strained fibers without cells. Uh, so a nice, uh, nice work by Joachim Spatz and Benny Geiger uh, from Germany showed that um, you can actually generate acellular fibronectin fibers uh, by applying force to fibronectin sheets. Okay, so what they've done is they formed a fibronectin film across micropillars. They wetted the pillars which applied a force to the tips of the pillars and that application of force then formed a fiber. So we actually do uh, fundamentally the same thing only we do it at the air liquid interface of a really small droplet. So we actually can form a really small droplet on a hydrophobic surface and with a pipette tip then dip it in and literally pull out a fibronectin fiber similar to how you might do um, like nylon. Uh, and so in that way we can actually now 
began to pattern um, fibers, fibronectin fibers. In this case, they were doubly labeled for fret analysis. And we see that uh, here is the direction of, um, of the substrate being stretched. We lose our fret signal and uh, perpendicular, because we get a compression, we actually enhance the fret signal. And here's uh, just some pictures showing that uh, we think we'll be able to seed cells on these fibers. Okay, so I have a few more minutes and I'm going to whiz through uh, the translation of some of this technology. Um, but uh, the conclusions with our work on fibronectin is that we real, really still don't fully understand the effect of force on fibers and how that's regulating uh, cell phenotype. Uh, we still are trying to figure out whether forces expo are exposing new cryptic sites uh, for new receptors on the cell surface uh, or whether these forces are simply disrupting or decoupling synergistic binding events. Uh, you know, our evidence is beginning to lean this way, but we can't rule out, rule out the top either. What we do know is that if we mimic different structural states of fibronectin type 3 repeats, we do seem to be able to gain some control over which integrin cells interact with their extracellular matrix. And so in this case, when we stabilize uh, the central cell binding domain, specifically the 9th and 10th type 3 repeats, we can actually enhance the apparent binding affinity, and I didn't talk a lot about it, but of uh, alpha 5, beta 1, and likely alpha 3, beta 1, but this is somewhat still controversial. Uh, what we do think is that we can direct, by directing integrin specific engagement, we can begin to allow some relative control, and I'm very cautious about this term. I'd love to say I could tell cell A to become B, uh, and I'm not entirely sure that uh, the ECM can do that. Uh, in general, what we see is that the ECM is really good at hitting the brake or hitting the gas. Uh, and so that's probably uh, where we're really, the paradigm that we're working with. So the big question then becomes in the last, say, five minutes or so, is how do we then translate this uh, to the next level? Um, uh, again, uh, how's gonna, how is one going to develop extracellular matrices that instruct cell and tissue state? Again, operating in this paradigm. And what I'm going to do is go back, actually, to the early provisional matrix and say that this is a nice opportunity to begin to engineer some of the features we see here at this stage. Uh, the reason is that no matter, we're all engineers, we're, and most of us are uh, trying to develop technologies that are probably going to uh, adapt with the body or be implanted in the body or have to integrate with the body. And in any point in time where you puncture a layer <laughs> of skin, um, including a, a purposeful incision and placement of an implant, you cannot avoid the formation of fibrin. Uh, and so, for us, it's a nice avenue to say, well, you're going to get it anyway. Let's re-engineer that so that it looks more regenerative as opposed to more scar and wound healing. Uh, so we actually use uh, some, um, again, I'll steal some terminology from Jeff Hubble. Uh, we're going to hijack some of the native biology of, um, of fibrin polymerization, specifically these two uh, sets of fibrin knobs, which have inherent binding affinity to fibrin pockets, or now we're calling them fibrin holes, uh, so the field has now uh, educated me on. Uh, and so what we're going to do is exploit these, uh, this inherent fibrin assembly, specifically fibrin knob peptides, uh, so these little knobs that are exposed when thrombin activates the protein to then uh, begin uh, self-assembly. Uh, we know that we can synthesize these synthetic knobs Here's one, GPRV, uh, which is uh, the human uh, A knob, uh, versus uh, this one, which is a synthetic analog of that. Uh, and we know they bind with um, relatively high affinity to these fibrinogen holes. Uh, what we wanted to ask was, uh, this has been out in the literature for about 30 years, what we wanted to ask was, can we, in, can we understand what the design principles are for building better knobs, uh, and, um, and can we do that? Uh, and so what we did was we actually designed uh, a number of different sort of knob variants, uh, this one being completely unique uh, to the literature. And what we found was that the binding affinity is dependent on the peptide residue properties. Um, uh, specifically, uh, from some molecular dynamics work uh, that Sarah Stabenfeld had done, we found that it's actually uh, 
the binding dynamics actually uh, depend on the stability of this backbone chain and actually this position of the side chain of the third arginine. So depending on whether it takes this, um, takes a trans or, trans or gauche uh, plus conformation, we get different binding affinities. And if we build in salt bridges and uh, between uh, side chains, we can actually begin to modify that affinity somewhat. Okay, so the big clue for us was, okay, now how do we begin to engineer in some of those biophysical properties that we want? We want to modify the biophysics uh, and the physical properties of the matrix and the biochemical properties of the matrix. And I'm going to touch on two different, uh, two different methods to do each one. Uh, so the first was if we express, uh, or uh, I should say present, a fiber knob domain on a synthetic molecule, a synthetic polymer like polyethylene glycol, uh, can we occupy those fibrin holes and sterically hinder uh, fibrin, fibrin self-assembly and can we regulate the dynamics of assembly and as a consequence of regulating the dynamics of assembly, regulate the polymer structure and material properties. So this is just some homework on looking at different peg sizes uh, and different uh, peptide motifs and their effects on uh, both percent clodability, that's our measure of activity of uh, fibrin, uh, and what we find is that, you know, as we expected, we get somewhat of a distribution. <clears throat> now, if we add those, um, some of the, the better products, at really, really low concentrations. So we're adding them at low enough concentrations so that we're not inhibiting fibrin polymerization, as you can see here. So this is the activity of the native protein, which sits around 95%, and we're modifying the polymer uh, in such a way that we always um, achieve at least 90% activity, somewhere between 90 and 95% activity. <coughs> the blue is our control, the red is our, uh, our unique peptide sequence that we uh, discovered, and then uh, the orange winds up in this case being um, a synthetic analog of the B knob instead of the A knob. Uh, and there's some evidence that, that that elicits very different responses. So what we see is that we can maintain its activity, but we significantly alter uh, the effective diffusion coefficient. Uh, so we can actually enhance diffusion of molecules through the polymer while still maintaining the same mass of protein in that polymer, which is pretty amazing. So you're thinking, okay, we've modified pore structure, and, and that's really uh, what we've done. Uh, here's the, the control. This is what native fibrin tends to look like. Uh, if we add uh, the ANOB mimetic, uh, which is something that's probably not uh, overtly obvious, is we get a lot of either fiber breaking or fiber, you know, sort of blunt end fibers. So fibers are growing and then they are truncated off. Uh, what's interesting about the B knob is you actually get what to me look more like tape like fibers. So they're a lot thinner and a lot finer. Um, and so then the question is, do we alter mechanical properties? Uh, and we saw some really interesting things, which is that here's a normal polymer here. Uh, when, we, uh, when we have this scenario, as you might expect, we actually decrease uh, the complex modulus. But what was shocking to us is that if you look at these two, here I'd say the, the complex modulus is going to be less here as well. But in fact, we can actually uh, push that in the other direction. Okay, so uh, the last little bit of this is we've now expressed these fibrin knobs on recombinant proteins. Uh, and in this case shown, unfortunately, again, it's not projecting well, that we can actually target these products, these recombinant protein products, into fibrin matrices, uh, and they're retained in fibrin matrices even during uh, a perfusion event. Okay, and so uh, where we're going with this is we're actually beginning to try to quantify polymer structure and predict cellular responses based on the architecture uh, uh, of the polymer through computational uh, models. And uh, I, will, I will end there. Uh, definitely thanking my lab. This is a lot of work that we've done and I've got a lot of bright kids in the, excuse me, young adults in the, uh, in the lab. Uh, my postdocs, uh, Dr. Sarah Stabenfeld, Dr. Kelly Claus, and Dr. Rodney Averett, uh, our senior scientist, uh, Sarah Jordan, uh, and our current graduate students, Ashley Carson, Allison Soon, uh, Vince Fiore, and Lee J. Cal, uh, and our collaborators in funding. And thank you very much. <laughs>